With me, I have the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Mr. Imran Khan. It's a pleasure to be here in Islamabad, My and thank pleasure. you very much My for pleasure. hosting me. The issue of Kashmir is back in the headlines. This is a territory that is split between India and Pakistan and has been since 1947, and numerous clashes and skirmishes have been fought there. Why is the issue so sensitive to Pakistan? Well, first, you know, for your audience to understand what is this Kashmir issue? What happened was that in 1947, Pakistan and India, uh, Pakistan came into being. India was partitioned. And it was, uh, the, because before that, the British were ruling India. So when they left, India was partitioned. The provinces, uh, the districts that had Muslim majority came to Pakistan. And the ones that had Hindu majority went to India. Now, Kashmir had 80% Muslim majority. And unfortunately, through various uh, sad events, uh, which should not have happened, because this should have been settled at the time of partition, uh, Kashmir became part of India. There was a fight between India and Pakistan. There was a ceasefire line. And then the United, Sta uh, United Nations Security Council passed a resolution that there should be a referendum, a plebiscite in Kashmir, and the people of Kashmir should decide whether they want to go to India or to Pakistan. Now, that plebiscite never took place. And so we fought three wars almost on Kashmir. Uh, we have, uh, and the last one was almost 50 years ago. And since then, uh, Kashmir has been this disputed territory in a limbo. Uh, and um, in the last 30 years, a movement started for independence in Kashmir. The elections in Kashmir were rigged by the Indian central government in 1989. After that, a movement started against uh, uh, wanting independence. And that movement steadily started going. The more India used force, today India has almost 900,000 security personnel in Kashmir. So the more force they use, the, the, the stronger the desire for people for freedom. So basically, it's uh, people of Kashmir wanting freedom, uh, what a, a right, the right for self-determination de de was uh, given to them by the United uh, Nations Security Council. Uh, and unfortunately, um, it is a question of might is right. That right has not been given because India is strong. And uh, recently, the whole issue now is that unilaterally, India has annexed Kashmir. So it no longer is a disputed territory as far as India is concerned. They have made it a part of India. And, and worse, their stated aim is to change the demography of Kashmir. So from a Muslim majority, India, this, this Indian government uh, is trying to uh, uh, settle, bring in Hindus, make the Kashmiris in Kashmir, Muslims, a, a minority from a majority. And so, uh, you know, naturally, I mean, this is not going to be acceptable to the people of Kashmir. For almost six weeks now, they have clamped down. They've put a uh, curfew in Kashmir. The people have been shut inside. There's no information coming out from Kashmir because this, this BJP government clearly has decided that through sheer force, they will, uh, they will subdue, they will oppress the people, they will... Uh, intimidate the people of Kashmir so much that they will accept this uh, illegal act. The words that we've been seeing are words like genocide, the largest prison, something like more than 6,000 arrests that have been made. How concerned are you about the situation and what relief can Pakistan offer? In the last 30 years, there are differing figures, but it's anything between 70,000 to 100,000 people have been killed in Kashmir. You know, through this uh, 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 the Indian government sending in their army, security forces. It's probably one of the most militarized area anywhere in the world. Per square foot, it has more security personnel than anywhere. Now they're almost 900,000 security uh, personnel there. There are United Nations reports of human rights abuse there, uh, of torture, of um, pellet guns, boys being blinded. Uh, the, the entire, their entire political leadership is under arrest, taken out of Kashmir. Apparently, there are some 4,000 
people had been picked up from Kashmir and taken out. So uh, it couldn't get any worse. Uh, what, they have, what they are doing, what the BJP government is doing in Kashmir is not only have they violated uh, the international law, uh, the, the United Nations resolution, the other uh, bilateral uh, agreement between Pakistan and India, the Simla agreement, that's been violated. They've gone against their own constitution. The Indian constitution guaranteed the, uh, the people in Kashmir a special status. That status has been taken away. They've actually gone against the, what the founding fathers of India, Pandit Nehru, Nehru, the first prime minister, what they had promised to the people of Kashmir. They've gone against that. What we fear now is that uh, this current BJP government is now going to use force. Uh, we fear that there will be oppression unprecedented. Already, as I said, between 70,000 to 100,000 Kashmiris have been killed. But what they are going to do now, we fear that this is uh, out and out genocide. Why, are they, why have they clamped down on media? They don't allow any media to get in there. Nothing is coming out of what is happening in the time they've imposed this curfew and these extra uh, uh, security personnel there. They did not even allow the leaders of the opposition parties to visit Kashmir. They didn't allow them there. So what are they trying to hide? Uh, sadly, I would have expected the world to react much more than it has. Why do you think the world hasn't reacted? Uh, I feel that, um, you know, markets, trade, material gains, I'm, I'm sad to say, are much more important than human beings. Uh, this is a classic case that uh, everyone I mean, this is, if ever there is a violation of human rights, a violation of international laws, this is what's happening right now. I mean, the fourth Geneva Convention, uh, Article 49, I think, it's a crime to try and change the demography of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of an area which is a disputed area, which does not belong to India. And to change the demography of that area is a war crime. So, I mean, uh, here is a government which, is, uh, which has broken every law, every humanitarian law. And unfortunately, I'm the, so far, so far, the response of the international community is not what we expected. The United Nations rights chiefs called for an international commission of inquiry to be set up it almost suggests that the situation there is as bad as it was or has been in Syria. Would you say that it could be that bad? Well, it could, it could be much worse because all we know is 8 million people are under siege. And no news is coming out of what is happening to these people. Now, 8 million people uh, uh, and what, and I'll just di digress. Let's just look at the BJP government, which is doing this. You would not expect in a normal democracy for a thing like that to happen. But my fear is that India has been taken over by an extreme ideology, the RSS ideology. Now, for your viewers, it's, it's important to understand what is RSS. RSS was a political party which came about in the 1920s, inspired by Adolf Hitler and Mussolini, by the Nazi party. This party believes in, in, in racial superiority, in the racial superior, superiority of Hindus. It does not consider other minorities uh, as equal citizens. This is, and this is the manifesto, the ideology of the founding fathers of RSS. This RSS was an extreme organization and as I said, it believed in the final solution, what Hitler did to the Jews. But this RSS ideology is what assassinated Mahatma Gandhi, probably arguably India's greatest leader, the freedom, the free, uh, the, uh, the, who played the biggest part in the freedom of India. Gandhi was assassinated by an RSS ideologue. This RSS was banned in India three times as a terrorist organization. And unfortunately, this RSS has taken over India. You see, 
every human society has its extremes, its liberals, and then majority are moderate. Problem happens in a human society when an extreme takes over that society. This is what happened when the Nazis took over Germany. This is exactly what is happening in India right now. They are being governed by this extreme ideology which does not recognize their, their constitution, international law, human rights, what the promises were made by the first prime minister to the people of Kashmir. They don't recognize anything because they do not consider other people equal to, the, to their idea of uh, the, the supremacy of the Hindus. So this is, a, I, I, I fear not just for people of Kashmir, I fear for what is going to be happening to two or almost 200 million Muslims who live in India, to the Christians who live in India. I fear that this ideology will be in, in past, whenever it has taken over a country, it's extremely destructive because it excludes other people. It's not an in inclusive ideology. India is a huge country. One billion people plus taken over by this, uh, this mindset, I think it, it, it spells danger, not just for Kashmiris, not just for uh, the, the, the minorities specifically. I mean, 200 million people, Muslims living in India, this is not a small number. I believe they're all at threat. And what is happening in India, if you, you can uh, verify this, there are people, there are journalists in India, you can verify what, it, this is not the India I knew. I knew India very well, I used to play cricket there. This is not the India I knew, and I'm afraid this is not the India of uh, Nehru and Gandhi, the founding fathers of India. So what we're talking about in Kashmir is actually happening in India-controlled Kashmir. What I understand from what you're saying is that there's the fear that that's just really the beginning and it's ultimately going to spread. And that's why the international community needs to pay more urgent attention. My fear is that a fascist, racist ideology has taken over India. Uh, it specifically, it is anti-Muslim. It... Uh, and, and if you read the accounts of their founding fathers, they openly th uh, considered the Muslims as who, who should have been uh, uh, ethnically cleansed from India. They believed in uh, the racial purity of Hindu uh, and the Hindu civilization could not reach its peak because of the uh, hundreds of years of Muslim rule. They openly talk about teaching the Muslims a lesson. I'm afraid uh, the Prime Minister Narendra Modi belongs to this RSS ideology. When the Gujarat riots took place, I believe in 2002, he was the Chief Minister. For three days they did not allow, they, they allowed the, uh, the, these uh, mobs a free reign to spread terror, kill thousands of Muslims. 100,000 Muslims were, were made homeless. So um, I fear that this ideology will not just stop in Kashmir. I feel that uh, they will, you know, Pakistan is at threat. They will try to take the world's attention from what is happening in Kashmir by uh, diverting attention to Pakistan by some sort of a false flag operation. For, by that I mean they will, um, you know, blame Pakistan for some incident that might happen in Kashmir and divert attention by, like they did before in February, they attacked us when some a suicide attack took place in Kashmir. They will do, I fear they will do the same again. Because what we're hearing from India's national security advisor is that they'll only lift the communication sanctions and the communication restrictions that you referenced once Pakistan stops sending what they call terrorists across the border and stops fomenting unrest. You see, <laughs> this is what we expected. In, in February what happened, a 20-year-old boy blew himself up uh, uh, and killed Indian soldiers. Now that Kashmiri boy, the parents said was brutalized by the police, radicalized by the security forces. They blamed Pakistan for that. We immediately asked them, look, if you have any proofs, we will, we will take action against these pe the people. They sent their jets to attack Pakistan, and a few days later came this, this, uh, these proofs. So they used that incident not only to uh, you know, divert attention to Pakistan, uh, diverting attention from the 
human rights abuse taking place in Kashmir, as there are two UN, UN uh, reports on the human rights uh, abuse in Kashmir. So they diverted attention. And then also, this anti-Muslim vote was mobilized by the BJP. They won by a bigger majority because they came as, you know, teaching Pakistan a lesson. And um, this jingoism, this war, hysteria, I feel they will be more of the same because they will again try what you are saying is absolutely right. They will try and divert attention from uh, clearly what we fear is, is genocide because they will only be able to change a Muslim majority area in, from a Muslim minority through genocide, through ethnic cleansing. And they want to divert the attention by this bogey of terrorism. India also says that what's happening in Kashmir is an internal affair. And, and I guess an, an argument that supports that is that one doesn't want the international community too engaged in conflicts elsewhere. What would your response be to that? Well, it would be an internal affair if Kashmir was part of India. But according to the United Nations Security Council re resolution in 1948, and there were 11 resolutions, it's a disputed territory. It's between Pakistan and India. And then those resolutions gave a right to the people of Kashmir, the right to decide their own destiny through a plebiscite, self-determination. That right was never given to them. And they, so they can't say it's an internal matter. Whenever we ask third party mediation, when for instance, I asked President Trump to mediate between uh, Pakistan and India, India said it's a bilateral issue. So when we try to talk to them, they said Kashmir is an internal issue. So I mean, they've, they've, we are going round and round these circles. The fact is that uh, what India is doing in Kashmir is going to have consequences way beyond the borders of India, uh, way beyond the subcontinent. Because, you know, this is now going to become a nuclear hotspot. If this becomes a flashpoint of uh, a conflict between India and Pakistan, this will be the first time uh, that two nuclear armed countries come face to face, and this is after the Cuban crisis. And this is why the world should now act. They should, th th this, is a, this is a disputed territory. The United Nations has a re responsibility to act now. And it's, it's not good enough to just make statements. They clearly, they have to go further than their just, just statements. Will you take a resolution to the UN at the end of September? Of course, I'm going to, uh, uh, in my address to the United Nations General Assembly, of course I'm going to say that the, it, it's a responsibility of the international community, the world community. And United Nations came into being after the Second World War specifically to address such issues. Uh, and, and they cannot put their head in the sand. This is a different situation now. This can, this can impact, as I said, it's outside the Indian subcontinent, it can impact the world. And this is the time to act. And I believe that the RSS ideology, this extreme racist, fascist ideology that has taken over India, a small group of ideologues have captured one over a billion people armed with nuclear weapons. The world community has to act. And do what? What do you want to see the world community do? The, the world community has acted before. It put sanctions. It uh, 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 put sanctions where it hurts, trade. I mean, the, but inaction is not an option. Because this, as I, I repeat, this will have consequences. This is not going to finish off, uh, you know, if we, if we ignore it, it's not going to disappear. There, at the moment, there are 8 million people who are threatened by this, this extreme ideology. Do you think the situation will get worse before it gets better, assuming it gets better? I think it all depends upon the way the, human, the international community reacts, how the United Nations reacts much more importantly how the G7 reacts. Because you see, uh, I, I can understand that countries are reluctant to act against countries where they have trading ties, where they have, and in the case of India, a huge market. And so they look upon India as a way, you know, they can uh, trade and then employment in their own countries. But I'm afraid 
this is a situation that, that could spiral out of control. And here am I as uh, uh, the Prime Minister of Pakistan. I feel that it, this, this situation is explosive. This 8 million people put under curfew, all their rights denied. God knows what's happening there. For all we know, there are these RSS gangs going in there and uh, picking up people, killing people. They've done that in the past. Um, you know, the RS gangs, I mean, they're just like the Nazi brown shirts. Uh, they were doing exactly the same sort of thing. These people have been trained in RSS camps, you know, who have all over India terrorized people. So what is happening to the people of Kashmir will have big reaction. It's not just going to have reaction in Kashmir. It will eventually have a, rea a reaction amongst the 200 million people, Muslims living in India. It will have a reaction in 1.3 billion Muslims all over the world because they will be seeing the this, this situation of Muslims. They've already saw in Myanmar where Muslims were ethnically cleansed. Now this 8 million Muslims under threat by a, a, a Hindu uh, extreme uh, ex government of extremists. And uh, I think that's why I feel that uh, the, the not acting is not an option just because it's a huge market, India, and sitting and watching this, uh, this tragedy unfold, I'm afraid it's not an option. I think people would be hard pushed to disagree with you that there's a role for the international community to play that it's not stepping up to. But what is Pakistan doing right now to actually bring relief to those people who are facing this crisis in Kashmir? There's nothing Pakistan can do. Uh, you know, uh, there's no relief we can send there. The borders are, are closed. Secondly, um, uh, the only thing we can do is approach the international community. Of course, we will use every forum, human rights. We are thinking of the International uh, Court of Justice, uh, United Nations General Assembly. Every forum we will use. We will, uh, we will knock on every door. Uh, the, the, the problem is, no one should expect that now any bilateral talks between India and Pakistan are going to solve anything. That, that stage has long gone. Uh, the only way is, uh, you know, of course, the United States, President Trump, he offered to mediate. India refused, saying it's a bilateral issue. Clearly, it's not a bilateral issue. It's, they've made it into a unilateral issue. So the only way is if, uh, you know, of course, the United States, Russian uh, President, Prime Minister Putin, he's a, a powerful man, he's a big voice in, in the world. Uh, uh, President Xi of China, um, you know, they, big powers, uh, France, Germany, Britain, they can play a role. Do you think President Trump, had he not been blocked by India, understands the problem and is able to solve it? But I think President Trump did not fully realize that uh, how he would be blocked by India because India knows that the moment the international community starts uh, taking an interest in, in Kashmir, they will know what is going on there. They will know how uh, the people of Kashmir in the last 30 years, I mean, this is not a small number, 70 to 100,000 Kashmiris killed in this. They will know the truth. As the United Nations Human Rights Report has come, twice, two reports about uh, um, the, all the abuses taking place by the Indian security forces in, in Kashmir. Do you think President Trump, had he not been blocked by India, understands the problem and is able to solve it? Well, the United States, I mean, you know, look, they are the most powerful country in the world. If anyone can, uh, you know, uh, solve it, it's, it's the U.S. But then U.S., if it's, it puts its weight behind the United Nations, and then, uh, you know, it can, uh, the other countries, the, the, so, uh, the Russian, Russia, China, the, the European countries, they, I mean, they have to understand, look, it's very important to understand this problem could spiral out of control. And spiral out of control, I mean, you hope for the best, but people should be prepared for the worst. The worst in this case is the un unimaginable. Two nuclear armed countries uh, getting into a conflict. Mr. Prime Minister, what do you think is the solution for Kashmir? There is only one solution. 
what the United uh, uh, Nations Security Council had promised the people of Kashmir, the right for self-determination. Let them decide what they want. This is what democracy is all about. And you think one day we could see potentially a sovereign Kashmir? I'm an optimist, a uh, born optimist. A sp you know, remember I was a sportsman and sportsman has to be optimist. Uh, I believe that, uh, you know, the government of Narendra Modi has made a huge mistake. What they have done is uh, they have taken a step where if either they, if they go all the way, they will have to massacre at a level which clearly will be unacceptable even right now when the world is sitting back. If they conduct a massacre to actually subdue the people, to intimidate them enough to accept uh, you know, them becoming a minority uh, and accept uh, that they will be enslaved for the rest of their lives, um, I think that that sort of a step will not be accepted by the world community, even if the world community is quiet today. If he now steps back, the way they have, a, you know, this curfew and what they've done to the people of Kashmir, if there were any, uh, any, any of those doubters in Kashmir before who would have, uh, who would have believed that they, they could live with India, even they would now all be wanting freedom. So the freedom movement would be so explosive now that I think it would be almost impossible for India not to grant them the right for self-determination. Whether it's the Americans or the Russians, if there was mediation taking place, no doubt both sides would have to sacrifice something. What would Pakistan be prepared to sacrifice? We would, we would go to the extent, whatever the people of Kashmir want, we will go along with that. We will stand with the will of the people of Kashmir. You talk about the issue being explosive. Do you think it could ultimately, worst case scenario, lead to Pakistan and India going to war? Well, we almost did. Uh, last February, when this, as I repeat, the suicide bomber blew himself, a 20-year-old boy blew himself up, uh, Indian soldiers died. Uh, the Indian planes came and bombed Pakistan. And we, we kept telling them that if you can give us any evidence of any Pakistani involved, we will take action. But, you know, they bombed us first, and then one of the uh, jets was downed in Pakistan. We returned the pilot. And what was and the response from India when you returned the when pilot? When we returned the pilot, it was a gesture of goodwill that we, you know, I mean, it's madness for two nuclear-armed countries to think of war. So we returned the pilot, and unfortunately, this, this mad, this fascist mindset, which is RSS mindset, they took it as a big victory that Pakistan is scared of India. That's why we, we returned the pilot. So this is why I, I'm saying uh, the world community must act, because we are not dealing with rational people there. This is not a rational government. RSS is not a rational ideology. The Nazi ideology of racism, Aryan race, racial superiority, and other races sort of, you know, being uh, almost at the level of animals is not a rational ideology. So we are up against this irrational madness. And that's why I keep repeating, to expect Pakistan now to re resolve this issue through bilateral talks, that is a pipe dream now, it's over. The international community has a responsibility now. Is there any chance of any kind of relationship improving between Pakistan and, and India under Prime Minister Modi? Well, as long as they are, they are uh, putting curfew uh, on, the, on 8 million people of Kashmir, and as long as they have uh, taken away their uh, 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 special status and revoked Article 370, there is no question of talking to them. I mean, if they withdraw from this and they lift the curfew, yes, then you can talk. But right now, there's no question. For years, India has accused Pakistan of being lenient on terror groups. What is your response to this? Well, <clears throat> firstly, Pakistan, since my, I have been the prime minister, I invite anyone any foreign observer 
I, even when I spoke to Prime Minister Modi, I told him, I said, you can use your intelligence agencies to check that any militant groups in Pakistan now we have taken action against. We had legacy of the 1980s when Pakistan was a frontline state fighting uh, you know, the, uh, against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. When, we, when all these uh, militant groups, Mujahideen groups, were trained in Pakistan. And unfortunately, uh, after the uh, Soviets left Afghanistan, we were left with these groups. And you know, maybe they should have been disarmed much earlier, but my government certainly, I can, as I said, I can, you can ask any uh, foreign uh, observers, we are willing to ask them, foreign media. We are the first government that has taken uh, these steps to remove these groups now. So uh, number one, I, you know, I invite any Indian observers to check uh, whether we are left with any of these groups. But much more importantly, uh, we have certain uh, problems with India. They have been through Afghanistan. They have been uh, conducting terrorist attacks, and especially in Balochistan, in our tribal areas. So we have a lot of complaints there too. That's why we wanted to immediately, when my government came into power, we said, let's talk on terrorism. We have certain complaints. We have got this spy who admitted that he is funding groups in Balochistan and in Karachi. So let's both sit down and uh, erase the past and move forward. A Pakistan cleric, Maluna Abdul Aziz, recently called for jihad on India. Previously, this man has openly talked about supporting Osama bin Laden. Can you say without inhibitions that this man does not speak for all of Pakistan? Look, they are, uh, if you want to quote people like him, let me just quote a BJP, this RSS uh, a chief minister, of the biggest province, UP. UP is the biggest province. The chief minister of the province, apart from uh, 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 the language he used against Muslims about you know, how they should be taught lessons and so on, he, and the chief minister of the province said that Muslim women should be dug out of the graves and raped. This is a chief minister. I mean, if, if I start quoting you know, members who sort of say that, you know, let's go to Kashmir and take these fair-skinned uh, Kashmiri women. I mean, the, the sort of comments that are come out are frightening. Point is, I can speak for the government. And I can tell you that the government, this government of mine, it, we have to, we, immediately when we came, we took a step that we will not allow any militant groups to operate from Pakistan. There, please don't be offended by the question, but there are some critics who say that Pakistan keeps al-Qaeda alive because doing so, it is able to continue getting money from the United States. Why, why has Pakistan not been able to defeat al-Qaeda and the Taliban after all these years? Uh, number one, al-Qaeda does not exist anymore. Uh, uh, you know, this idea that we would uh, use al-Qaeda to make money. I mean, what Pakistan in the war on terror, uh, when we participated in the U.S. war on terror, Pakistan lost 70,000 people. We had 70,000 casualties in the war. Secondly, this country lost over $100 billion. Our economy lost over $100 billion. The, the aid which we got was 20 to $30 billion at most to fight this war. The country lost far, far more than any money we got. And in terms of human lives, I don't think any country lost so many human beings as we did in this war on terror. So this is just uh, you know this nonsense that we would keep uh, Al-Qaeda alive. And then the other thing about Taliban, you know, uh, at the moment, Pakistan is playing its, its, its role in what it should always have played its role in, in bringing peace in Afghanistan. Unfortunately, our governments kept trying to, uh, you know, uh, uh, fight a war which was not our war. And in the end, as I said, we, we are the country that suffered. I was the one who was always against fighting this war. I never thought we should have participated in this war because Pakistan had nothing, nothing to do with 9-11. Why were we in part of this war? Why did we lose so many people? 
And then we were blamed when uh, the U.S. could not win in Afghanistan. We were blamed for it, which I thought was extremely unjust. As you say, the Trump administration has previously attacked you for stating that Pakistan is at least in part responsible for it not being able to, to win its struggles in Afghanistan. How do you characterize your relationship with President Trump at this time? My relationship with President Trump uh, couldn't be better. I mean, we get along very well. And I have to say that uh, he was extremely hospitable when uh, my delegation and I went to the White House, he, you know, uh, I mean, we were all uh, uh, amazed and uh, blown over by the hospitality. But uh, I do not think that uh, the Trump administration fully understands the dynamics of Afghanistan. The Soviets uh, were there nine years, and, uh, you know, that was an ex experiment. Uh, uh, an experience, rather, every, everyone, for everyone to see. Almost a million Afghans died. And in the end, the Soviets had to retreat. Uh, the nature of Afghanistan is such that it, you know, it is, people can conquer Afghanistan, but from the time when the British were a superpower, even they realized that staying there was very difficult because the people do not accept foreigners. Now, what has been happening in Afghanistan uh, you know, is, is something which has always happened in Afghanistan. You know, they, 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 against the foreigners, the, the country just, uh, you, you fight a nation. So, you know, blaming Pakistan for what went wrong in Afghanistan is just uh, very unfair because, you know, as I said, the Russian, ex the Soviets ex experience, when the Soviets were in Afghanistan, they lost 50,000 uh, soldiers there. And yet they could not conquer it, or they could not subdue it. Do you support the Americans leaving Afghanistan? And how would you characterize the 20 plus minus years of the Americans being there? You see, uh, the, uh, the Americans uh, will have to, of course, leave Afghanistan. And I think President Trump wants the US soldiers to leave Afghanistan. Now, this is the tricky bit. How do they, you know, what is the manner of uh, withdrawal? Um, this talk between Taliban, the Americans, and hopefully the Afghan government, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, 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 whatever the political settlement, uh, it has to be inclusive. Uh, and that's where the Americans should not leave until the settlement takes place. Because when the, the Soviets left Afghanistan last time, and so did the Americans packed up and left too. Chaos took place. I mean, what happened in uh, Afghanistan, the civil war that happened, uh, and, and then the Pakistan, uh, the fallout, the refugee problems. I'm afraid, um, uh, you know, the people of Afghanistan cannot afford a similar sort of scenario. So it should be a very planned withdrawal with a settlement in Afghanistan. And that is what we are all praying for. President Trump announced the suspension of talks with the Taliban. What can Pakistan do? Well, Pakistan, <laughs> Pakistan, you know, there's not a lot more than Pakistan can do than what it is already doing, which is trying, urging the Taliban uh, on who it has influence to sit down and, 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 uh, and talk to the Americans, which, which they have done, and also talk to the Afghan government, which they haven't done as yet. But the problem is, uh, you know, it was always going to be bumpy. This, this thing about, uh, you know, f fight and talk is always a very difficult proposition. I, I, I just hope that they sh had there been a ceasefire and then talks took place, it would have been much easier. Now, there are all this bloodletting taking place in Afghanistan. And at the same time, um, these talks are well, I thought were going at a pretty good uh, uh, rate. They were progressing pretty well. So now, uh, I don't know whether it's a temp temporary hiccup. I pray that it is, or it is, uh, you know, going to uh, impact the, uh, uh, in the medium or long term. I hope that it is just a temporary hiccup and the talks resume. Because whatever happens, the people of Afghanistan want peace. For four decades, there has been bloodshed there, and you know, we all pray that this, uh, 
uh, these talks bring in peace. Do you think the Americans will leave? I think uh, that's what the talks would be. Otherwise, if the Americans stay, they will always be, as I said, the, it's in the, the, the Afghan history. They do not accept foreigners. The former U.S. Defense Secretary James Mattis said Pakistan is the world's most dangerous country. What do you make of that? Well, had we not participated in the American war, you know, after 9-11, uh, we would not have been the world's dangerous country. By participating in the war, and I repeat, I was against it. Because, you see, here in the 80s, we were training these mujahideen, people to do jihad, against the Soviets uh, when they occupied Afghanistan. So these people were trained by Pakistan, funded by the American CIA. And now, a decade later, when the Americans uh, come into Afghanistan, the same groups who are all in Pakistan are supposed to say that, no, now because the Americans are there, it's no longer jihad, it's terrorism. You know, it was a big contradiction, and I strongly felt that, uh, you know, Pakistan should have been neutral because by joining in, these groups turned against us. So we, you know, we lost 70,000 people. We lost, you know, as I said, over $100 billion to the economy. And in the end, we were blamed for the, for the, uh, the Americans not see, succeeding in Afghanistan. I felt it was very unfair on Pakistan. You spoke about Russia playing a potential role. What do you think, or what do you expect from Russia as a good ally to both Pakistan and India, but historically closer to India? Yes, I hope now uh, um, Russia will get closer to Pakistan. I hope, uh, I had a very good chat with uh, President Putin. We, had, we talked about everything under the sun. Uh, and I felt, uh, and I did tell President Putin that, you know, forget about the Cold War when we were on different sides. The world has changed. Uh, and, um, you know, we, we should develop a new relationship. And I hope we do. Because, um, you know, Russia, you know, the main powers in the world, America, Russia, China. And uh, if these three powers decide they can resolve most of the world issues, and specifically this Kashmir issue, which, which, which uh, potentially is, is the most explosive issue in the world today. And if these three powers get together, I think they can resolve it. Arms deals are being provided by Russia to both India and Pakistan. Is this a double standard when it comes to resolving the issue, specifically, as you say, of Kashmir? Well, sadly, the arms uh, uh, deals are all a, a question of demand and supply. Uh, you know, we shouldn't expect too much morality when uh, it's, it comes to selling arms. Uh, but, it, but, you know, I repeat, this is very serious. This could all go very wrong, this conflict between Pakistan and India, simply because, you know, we are two countries who have nuclear weapons. And that's why I think there is a big incentive for the world to step in now. What is... Pakistan's nuclear strategy that was recently misquoted. Is it no nuclear first strike policy or does it depend on the circumstances? Look, um, I, I can't say, uh, you know, I never in my life did I ever imagine that I would have to be thinking in these terms. No ra rational human being can think of a nuclear war. I'm talking about rational. What is the government in India is not rational. It's not a rational government. Racist, fascist governments are not, ra are not rational, who do not consider other human beings the equal. What the Nazis did, gassing Jews, is not a rational thing. Human minds don't think like that. So um, <clears throat> uh, because of this government, for the first time, I'm, I also think that what if I, we have to have this choice? You know, either surrender what if you ever reach that stage? A country, it's possible. One country would win, one would lose. But in this case, what if you are left with a choice of surrender or, or fight to death? And for a nuclear country to fight till death, you know, this is, it has implications for everyone. No one wins that war. You mentioned earlier, having been a sportsman, one has to be optimistic. How would you compare the world of cricket and the world of government? The only thing cricket or sports, the only thing that teaches you is the ability to struggle. No one reaches the top in international sport until they have that 
uh, ability to keep taking the knock, struggle, fight, pick yourself up uh, from uh, setbacks, learn from your mistakes. These are the lessons sports teaches you when you compete at the high level. But this is something which is invaluable in anywhere, whatever you do in life. When you were 20, hmm? what advice would you give yourself at that age? When I was 20, I had, you know, this, I was actually trying to finish my university education. And I was in this dilemma where I had this passion and obsession with cricket, which was, I was on the verge of uh, entering big time cricket. And then I, I also wanted to complete my studies. So I, 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 I would give myself the advice that I have to finish my studies uh, because this will help me in cricket because studies will teach me how to analyze my game better than other sportsmen because that's what university education helps you. You, you, you have that ability to analyze your mistakes better than others and then pick yourself up and uh, become better than before. Mr. Prime Minister, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for your time.